down inside the threads to where they're at least the same dimensions from start to finish. Okay, you'll see some red clear down into the bottom. We're going to cut that next with a tool that I've made that works off of the bolt body where the body runs. So what we're going to do is we're trying to keep everything square. So instead of doing the inside surfaces off of the outside of the receiver, I'm more concerned with keeping the bolt in there straight and in full contact. So I'm going to run my tool down in here. I'm going to cut that surface. And then after I have that surface, the next tool I've got is based off of this shoulder right here. So when that screws down inside the threads, I've got the threads loose so I'm not um, forcing the tool around on the threads, but concentrating more on the inner surface right here. So when this surface butts up square and true to the bottom here, is then we're going to cut the outside surface to that. But okay. first, just as a visual, you see the red down on the inside of the lugs. Yes. Okay. Now when you look in there, you can see that some of it's cut and some of it's not. Right. Well, that's probably because the... the uh, face isn't true. Well, the face isn't true is probably because when they set it up in their machines at Remington, it wasn't quite perfect. Okay. And we're only talking about a little bit down in there on the inside, but it's one of those things that a little bit here means a lot at distance downrange. Right. So, let's go ahead and get that cleaned up, and then we'll move on to the next part. Now okay. that I've got the inside of the receiver squared up, my tools in there, bottomed out and up tight. Now we're going to true up the outside face. Do this, the best way I can find to do it is to do it between centers off of that squared shoulder. So let's get this set up in the machine. Now I got it set up in between the machine and again I'm just going to take a, the minimum amount I can to clean that surface up. see here to where it's started to cut here and it's not touching anywhere else up here. Yeah, I see that. Well, that just means that that face isn't square to the inner lugs or the bolt body or anything else. And this is again, you know, this would actually be, we started out with a lug that was pushing the barrel up and to the left. Now it's from the receiver's aspect, it's getting pushed down and to the right. Okay. So now we've got two other stresses involved with this bullet trying to get down range. We have no idea where it should be going and this may cause problems with you know dialing up on your scope for elevation when the gun's not pointed in the same direction as your scope. Right, that makes sense. Pointed in the same direction. Beautiful. Okay, what we're going to do here is we're setting up a barrel to thread and chamber it. First thing I do is I get out here on the muzzle end, I cut it off within an inch of where the crown's going to be. That way I have a spot that I can turn concentric to the bore line to hold on to for all my other machining work so I actually have a hold of it. See, so I can face it off flat. Now I'm actually going to run off of the rifling there. And I've done the same thing at this end as well. I turn them flat and then chamfer that edge so that my centers can run directly on it instead of somebody's center that has been drilled in there from some manufacturers, barrel manufacturers like on this one here. Um, it's a nice chamfer and all but I can't say that I completely trust it because I didn't do it myself so that's why I face them off flat. Now we'll throw it in the machine and get it ready. For okay, now we're going to set up and turn the the shank of the barrel round and concentric to our thread uh, diameter. 
Uh, thread tenon is going to be, in this case, 891 thousandths long. Take a skim pass here to get things concentric. Take a measurement. I'll be turning this down to one inch sixty thousandths for the inch and a sixteenth sixteen TPI for a Remington seven hundred. So after this pass, what we'll do is we'll measure it. And I'll pause the camera, we'll get it caught up where we're on our final pass before we do our thread. So that's where we'll come back okay. to. I've got the thread tenon down to diameter. Uh, it's a little short, and you'll see why when it comes time to uh, time the flutes up. And now we're getting ready to thread it, and it's going to be uh, 16 TPI, 16 threads per inch. Um, you'll see that this is one of the few times that I use pre-ground carbide tooling. Uh, real nice thing about that, doing it this way is if for some reason my tool chips or breaks I can just index it around to the next cutter point without losing my setup or time or anything like that. It'll go right back into the same timing without having any problems. Take a little bit of skim pass to make sure the machine's all set up correctly. Pitch gauge out, 16 TPI, looks good to me, now we're going to go ahead and thread it. Okay, I've got the shank threaded where the receiver will just barely thread on. I'm going to polish the, the sides of the flanks of the thread and the tops of the threads. This is going to loosen up in the receiver just a little bit, but then again this is stainless on a barrel, stainless barrel on a stainless action. The last thing I want to do is gall the barrel into the action uh, because my threads are so doggone tight. Again, we want this shoulder here that we mentioned earlier on the front 
to be in contact with the recoil lug squarely and evenly. So if the threads are just a touch loose, I'm not saying like a hardware nut, but just, just a touch loose, it'll actually be a good thing in this situation. I do it this way so you can still see it with a camera and get my hands out of your way. <laughs> Alright. There we go. So what's the next step into this? Well, then we make sure that this thread's on all the way up to the top. And then we'll do a counter bore to accept the bolt. Actually, I apologize. Next step is to time the flutes so that they are in line with the sides of the stock in this case. So we have metal meet the edge of the wood rather than an airspace like on the side of the flute. A couple reasons it looks better and it uh, is better when you're bedding them so you don't have that lip for bedding material to get in and basically glue your gun into the stock unintentionally. So, it looks like I'm going to need to bring it around to where this flute here is on top, or top dead center. That way you can see these pieces will meet the wood or in this case synthetic stock actually. There's a little trial and error and some math to timing barrels, timing flutes on barrels. It's pretty simple. 16 TPI, you take 1 divided by 16 and that tells you how many thousands of travel you get per revolution. Then we figure out how much revolution that we need, divide it by that, and make that cut. But you always stop a little short. Now this is one of the shoulders that controls or aids in accuracy and consistency, so I want that cut just as clean and as smooth as I can possibly make it. Just for reference, the difference between the top of this land here and the bottom of this flute being top dead center is five thousandths off of this shoulder, which is just a skosh more than the thickness of one piece of paper. So it's a very little cut.
but if I go too much, we got to go to the next one. And we try not to miss this. So I'm going to come up and I'm going to take about three thousandths and see where we're actually at. I've got the action and the barrel timed, so the flute that I want up is up. Uh, next process is going to be is I cut the counterbore so we can stick the bolt back in it. All right, it'll take a couple seconds okay. to set up. I'm going to cut the counterbore in the end of the barrel. It's going to be much like this one here. This one's a takeoff barrel from another Remington that had an M16 style extractor in it. But you'll see that the bolt actually needs to fit inside this counterbore. Man, this one's extremely oversized. Um, but we're doing that right here to this one right now. Otherwise, when we screw it into the action, it can't close. The other reason we do this is instead of just having it flat, like this barrel, okay, how it doesn't go inside, but this is a completed barrel off of a different type of gun. It's a safety factor. The more times gases or any kind of debris comes out and has to change direction, it's that much more energy that it soaks up and less that can get back to the shooter. So it's just one of those, it's commonly referred to as a, a three rings of steel from Remington. I'm not exactly sure how they count three rings, but as the gas comes out, it has to hit the end of the bolt nose travels sideways out to the next, next wall out. So there's two direction changes for safety and then the third direction to make it come back to you. Uh, more things that can change uh, the direction of the of vaporized brass or gas coming back at you is a good thing. So let's go ahead and punch this chamber or the counterbore in 150 thousandths. Yeah, I know I'm using an end mill. It's not generally the most condoned way of, of doing this, but it's a real easy way to get a flat bottomed hole that's a little bit shallow and a little bit undersized. So when I come in with a boring bar, it saves a lot of work. Now there are companies that make actual counter piloted counter bore cutters to do this, but since I work with so many different types of actions and everything else like that, I figured the money's better spent in other places. get me started.
Airborne needs to be 700 in diameter. So I've got plenty of room to clean up any kind of ugliness that end mill left. You'll notice I use micrometers a lot more, well, primarily. I'm not a big fan of, of calipers, especially the digital ones. They, they're not nearly as accurate or dependable. thousands to go. Put a chamfer on the front.
You run them in about 30,000 steep at a 30 degree angle. 30 degree angle is just convenient because of the way the compound's set for threading. But I find that it makes a nice little feed ramp for running guys out of the magazine. Okay. A little rough from the tool. We'll reach in there and polish that up. I like to polish this before I do the chamber. That way I don't have to worry about this rough or coarse sandpaper around the chamber accidentally slipping in there and making a rough spot in the chamber. Well, that's all the machining that needs to okay, be done Okay, we got there. the counterbore cut in. So really, as far as the machining goes, what we've got left to do is chamber it, cut and crown, and uh, that's it for machining. So, now you see what it takes, except for, like I said, the chambering portion, which we will get to later, what it takes, thread and chamber again.